thank you all for coming. I'm delighted to see you and see uh, not old friends, but friends of long standing here today. Uh, I'm delighted that uh, the Reverend Dr. Susan Henry Crow will be our Wilson lecturer. Uh, Susan is a good friend and colleague. She has served as the Social Justice Agency's top executive since 2014. Prior to her service at the Board of Church and Society, she served as Dean of the Chapel and Religious Life at Emory University. Her interreligious ministry with a constituency of 12,000 students and 2,400 faculty members with Christian, Jewish, Islamic, Hindu, Buddhist, and Baha'i communities. She has been repeatedly recognized for her work and commitment to social justice, including being named Chaplain of the Year by GBHEM. Susan has, always, has already served as a member of the United Methodist Judicial Council. There are some of us who wish she was still in that role. Yeah. <laughs> she is the first woman elected president of the Judicial Council, serving in that role from 2008 to 2012. As an elder in the United Methodist Church, she is a member of the South Carolina Annual Conference, where she served three pastoral appointments and as associate director and then director of the Conference Council on Ministries. Recipient of a master's degree from Candler School of Theology, Emory University. She also holds a Doctor of Divinity degree, Doctor of Divinity degrees from Wofford College and LaGrange College. She has served on the boards of trustees for Claflin University, Columbia College, and Santiago College. Susan, we hear you gladly. It is a real honor to see so many friends and to be with you today. Uh, Madam Secretary, <laughs> we like to say that to each other. <laughs> it feels really good. <laughs> Thank you for this wonderful invitation and most especially to be with friends across the connection gathered here at higher education. Uh, there are bishops in this room, there are presidents of colleges and universities with whom I've had long-standing relationships, there are board members here. I have many friends and many distinguished guests. Um, it is a real honor to have this time to share today. Uh, when Kim asked me if I would come and talk about this, I asked her what she wanted me to do, and she said, well, you can talk about the social principles which I can, and I'm going to a little bit. Um, but I am going to put this in context um, of a larger world, because it is the world that is important to me. And from what Kim has also said, you can see what my long-term commitment to higher education and ministry has been. Uh, I love this board. I love the work that this board does. And both of the things that you do in the larger sense, which is higher education on the one hand and ministry on the other, are cornerstones of United Methodism. So today we will explore the movement between the private sphere and the public square. The people called Methodists, United Methodists, have wed the private sphere and the public square throughout its history. The Wesleys lifted up the relationships between personal piety and social holiness from the very beginning of the meeting, the movement. Those of us who are cradle Methodists grew up with this in our DNA, come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. Or in my MYF, which became my UMYF, a charge to keep I have to serve the present age. Private sphere is a foundation for engagement in the public square. Throughout my lifetime, I have lived in a dozen or so towns and cities in the United States, crossing from one home to another, 
from one season to another, from one school to the next, and back and forth between the private sphere and the public square. It really began in a small town in Lenore, North Carolina. Does anybody know where that is? Yes! <laughs> my earliest memories are of living with my parents and my paternal grandmother. There are two snapshots I have of the role of faith and the public square, both of which began there. These are the stories of how I fell in love, in love with the world and in love with the church. And here is the first one. The first snapshot is of my first baby doll. Her name is City Hall. <laughs> I remember asking my mother years later how a two-year-old comes to name her first doll City Hall. She said it was what I heard. The tone and words must have sounded important, and City Hall engendered affection and respect in my hearing. It seemed like someone was always going to City Hall, which in my world was the center of my life beyond the home. It was a small town in the 1950s, and much business was transacted at City Hall. I have memories of my stately grandmother dressing to go to City Hall on what seemed like a regular basis. I still have City Hall. Much like government and perhaps governance, in many parts of the United States, City Hall is old and worn. Her cherub face is dirty, and she now has a re-sewn cotton body that my mother refurbished some 40 years ago. My little City Hall, representing my most intimate world and what was becoming a larger world. From the cradle, I was fascinated with the public square, the world, and seats of influence, where the public square and where governing mattered, and was reviewed nightly at the dinner table. I heard about deeds and titles and registration and voting in court. City Hall was where the people participated in making important things happen. These values and virtues came from my family, their religious communities and their affections and their behavior. So what is the public square? <clears throat> you know that the public square is the agora. The original idea of the agora was the Greek marketplace. It is the intersection of two or more streets, a plaza, a gathering place, a place where ideas are shared and discussed, where business is transacted, where the public good is engendered, where the Pope stretches out his arms and blesses the community, where songs of freedom are sung, where marches are held, and where people come together. I was in Ephesus some years ago with a wonderful tour guide. Walking through the city of Ephesus not only helped me understand Paul, which I had had a little trouble with, but also made vivid the roots of public life at the crossroads. There was one of the three largest libraries in the world along the path to the city center. It was one of the seven cities John addressed in Revelation. It was where business and governance and commerce and law and religion intersected. The U.S. origins of the public square lie in the uh, colonial village. In the colonial village, again, we find business and commerce and law and religious, religion intersecting. And the public square in the colonial village was dependent on discourse, debate, and the free press, which advocated for the birth of a new nation. It was driven by conversation and engagement of the issues of the day, and the emerging new nation which would become the United States of America 
was born in the public square. And even today, perhaps this 250-year-old magnificent nation is being reformed in the public square. With gatherings and debate and voting and marching and forming discourse that affects and changes, hopefully, the public good. Today, the public square is evolving. It remains in cities and capitals, but it has also moved onto other stages. The public square now includes social media, <clears throat> Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and on and on. And often the exchange of opinions and thoughts and ideas is now charged and loud and bold, sometimes laced with hyperbole and misspellings and curious configurations on blogs and local television and nightly news. Today, the public square is not only where people literally meet to converse, often comment and reflect, but also where people muse and insufferably opine. This is not to suggest that there was not insufferable opining in days gone by on the village green, but today it is much faster and more widely spread. Also, there is the honest exchange of thoughtful ideas grounded in moral, religious, and political thinking, which is respectful and learned. It is what you are about. In a variety of conferences, on public broadcasting, in newspapers and editorials, on issues of immigration and women's rights and civil rights and prison reform and poverty. And I would add that the church is capable, not always practicing, but capable of taking the higher ground of engaging thoughtful debate and faithful witness. So what is religion in the public square? The founding of the US and this particular democracy was deeply influenced by religion. Democracy was born in the public square with strong religious influences. And I want to very briefly name three that were important in the formation of this democracy. For those of you who love history, you will like this. For those of you who don't, it will seem not as important. <laughs> but it is important to get to where I want to go. First is the importance of the separation of church and state. Roger Williams, the reformed English the theologian, was a staunch supporter of religious freedom, as well as being an abolitionist, strongly arguing for the separation of church and state. He also insisted on fair dealings with Native Americans, but his great worry was that the church could never free itself from the corruption of government. His influence was important for the principle of the separation of church and state as a foundation of this very democracy. The second point is the Methodist movement's founder, John Wesley, thought that the authority to govern was derived from God rather than from the people. Wesley supported a constitutional benevolent monarchy as the best Republican, small r, form of democracy. While Wesley was a strong proponent of ending child labor, prison reform, and other social issues, Wesley did not align himself with some of the political reformers of the day, excepting on the issue of slavery. Wesley strongly supported the efforts of Wilberforce and other anti-slavery leaders. And his influence in the formation of the people called Methodists was significant in the formation of the nation with his own mixed views on the colonies and the new country. And then the third influence of the new nation was the first and second Great Awakenings, 1730 to 1743 for the first, 
and where the idea of religion's active role in social movements and reform was solidifying. The second Great Awakening, 1790 to 1840, was a strong social reform movement, especially in anti-slavery. Leadership for many social reform movements, political and moral leaders came during the Second Great Awakening, and they came from the African American community, many of whom were Methodists, Baptists, and members of the free church movements. These are a few of the factors and the influences on the formation of the new democracy and the foundations of religion grounding social reform. And now I want to go back to the second snapshot. I fell in love with the church at a very young age. It is the memory of my strong, the strong presence of my Aunt Della Wright. She was the sister of my grandmother. She was a deaconess and a member in the Methodist Church South. I was enthralled with the stories of her travels and her work in the world. Even at four years of age, I was captivated by her adventures. Here is what her life was like. Imagine being a 25-year-old single woman from North Carolina in 1905, sailing to Brazil to become the principal of the Colegio Americana in Porta Alegre. Imagine. And after a few years, she went on to a community center in Brownsville, Texas. And she was heroic in my little mind. My family had a deep commitment to public education as well as education in private institutions. Aunt Della's devotion to service in the church and in the world was in my DNA. The fundamental value of education and Christian service so as to contribute to the public good began in my home in a small town in a Methodist church. It of course extended to my own religious life, never clearly able to divide the two. These values grew out of a long-standing Methodist identity that I carry, and my love of the world and many cultures began in this house where the return of Aunt Della was anticipated with great joy. I continue to this day to be in love with the world, a universe of difference myriad cultures, a variety of landscapes, intriguing geopolitical politics, amazing social constructs, and complex economies. My family in the church transmitted these values and the virtues that emanate from them. Here embodied in my little sphere was a sense of enchantment about the world a wonder-filled desire to engage in the church and the public square. The private sphere, home, local, prayer, dinner conversation, and the public square, the larger world, the globe, were constantly interfacing. But it was not unique to me. It is in our DNA. So how is it that Methodists engage society? Long before the birth, the 1968 birth of the United Methodist Church, the Methodist Church and its predecessor bodies took positions on a variety of issues believing that the person, the society, and the church could not live in isolation from one another. The person the society and the church could not live without each other. On the matter of war, for example, Mr. Wesley declared, there is a more horrid reproach to the Christian name, yea, to the name of man, to all reason and humanity. There is war in the world, 
war between men and between Christians. I mean those that bear the name of Christ. In 1960, I mean 1860, sorry, the doctrines and the discipline of the Methodist Episcopal Church, the general rules said of Christian men's goods, wealth, the riches and goods of Christians are not common as touching the right title and possession of the same, as some do falsely boast, notwithstanding, every man ought of such things as he possesseth liberally to give alms to the poor according to his ability. And you know that between 1844 and 1839, almost 100 years, the church in the United States divided torn by the sin of slavery and racism. But even divided, the General Conference of the, ME, of the Methodist Episcopal Church and the ME Church South both took bold stands. In 1924, the ME Church General Conference addressed economic injustice and conflict to international tension and war by declaring now, 1924 is right after World War I and before World War II. And the statement was, selfish nationalism, economic imperialism, and militarism must cease. The protection of special privileges secured by investors in foreign lands as too often imperiled the peace of nations. This source of danger must be prevented. The rights of the smallest nation must be held as sacred as those of the strongest. And in 1934, the Emmy Church South said, to preach at least once each year on world peace, the evils of war, and the evils attendant upon compulsory military training in schools and colleges. The Emmy Church South, true to the principles, this is still the quote, true to the principles of the New Testament, teaches respect for properly constituted civil authority. It holds that government rests upon the support of its conscientious citizenship and that conscientious objectors to war in any or all of its manifestations are a natural outgrowth of the principle of goodwill and the Christian desire for universal peace, and that such objectors should not be oppressed by compulsory military service anywhere or at any time. Throughout the history, we have held bold statements of conscience, guiding the church and interfacing with society, taking stands for justice. These statements of, and dozens of others led to the formation of the social principles of the United Methodist Church. So now, the social principles. I'm gonna see if I can do this. There we go. The first slide here is the General Conference in Dallas in 1968 created the Social Principles Study Commission. In 1970, there was a special session of the General Conference. You might have heard about that <laughs> in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, where there was a report of the Social Principles. And the General Conference in 1972 in Atlanta, Georgia, adopted the social principles of the United Methodist Church. In 1968, the General Conference said, there shall be a social principles study commission appointed with authorization to study part three of the plan of union and to bring to the General Conference of 72 a recommendation concerning the United Methodist Church's statement of social principles. And this is who served on that, Bishop Thomas of blessed memory who ordained me, <laughs> graduated from Claflin, chaired the committee. 
The vice chair was Willard Fetter, and the secretary was Alice Braun. Dudley Ward had uh, worked at what would become GBCS, and then you see the rest of the membership. <laughs> Daryl Stevens does a good job of talking about what in the merger were coming together and what the contributions from the Methodist Church social creed were and what the evangelical, Uni evangelical United Brethren moral stands were that led to the social principles. The Methodist Church had strong statements on family, economic life, church and general welfare, human rights, and peace and world order. The EUBs had strong statements on the church and economic life, community life, family life, moral and social conduct, racial and cultural relations, and world order. And much of the strength of <coughs> what came to be in the social principles on um, race really came in part from the EUBs, um, which is a point that sometimes gets lost. The 72 social principles have these six categories which exist to this day. The natural world, the nurturing community, the social, the economic, the political, and the world community. And I've just said that. Um, oh, I do need to go back. The EUBs, uh, Daryl Stevens says, assumes the prophetic holy witness to secular society, whereas the Methodist Church assumes the posture of an institution accustomed to wielding political power within society. The Methodist Church assumes direct power and influence within society, and the EUB's witness to society through holiness. And these are really interesting observations and um, someday, sometime, worth talking about. Um, in 1972, in his book, Where Do We Go From Here?, which influenced the commission, chapter six was entitled The World, Com the World House. And the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. made this statement and said, some years ago, a famous novelist died. Among his papers were found a list of suggested plots for future stories. The most prominently underscored being this, a widely separated family inherited a house in which they have to live together. Bishop Talbot uh, in the report says, the theme of our document is community. Now this concept became an exciting one for us when we recognize that it is in with the various communities that we find ourselves. We are challenged to work out of our existence, work out our existence. We may describe these as natural communities or human communities. And Bishop Thomas finally said, it is inevitable that many will wonder why specific issues were not given more extensive treatment. This must not be seen as a lack of interest or emphasis. The commission defined its task as that of setting forth principles general enough to be the basis of more specific resolutions, yet specific enough to leave no doubt as to the subject under consideration. So the genius of the social principles is, is that they address issues where suffering, injustice, and inequality exist. The social principles give the church an opportunity to speak and live out its faith in communities and societies and cultures all around the world. And they provide a way for religious voices to be heard in the halls of power bishops and general agencies and annual conferences and pastors and churches find guidance and confidence in speaking on now the 76 statements adopted by the general conference as written by united methodists from across the globe who face myriad injustices and inequalities I'm about to finish, but think for just a minute on these issues. Helping people engage their governments and leaders sometimes about life and death issues. The people in Alabama face an issue of control over water 
from Tennessee and Georgia. That's an important issue. Clean water in Liberia is also an issue. Free and fair elections in Nigeria and free and fair elections in North Carolina. Farm workers in South Carolina and diamond mi miners in Russia and Botswana and South Africa. Traffic children from Asia to the United States and the largest population being boys between the ages of 9 and 11 and girls between 11 and 13. And 40 million Americans, U.S., that will end up without health care if Medicaid is lost. And an Angolan economy where a modest hotel breakfast costs $75. And today, in Tennessee, an execution that is set. And the cradle to prison pipeline and on and on. Our annual conferences throughout the globe find strength and encouragement for addressing the issues facing the societies. So what is possible when the church and the public square find strength and encouragement and come together? It is vexing and it is mixed. The, social, uh, the civil rights movement in the U.S. would not have happened without the strong role of the church in the public square. In issues of injustice on civil and human rights advanced sometimes with support of the church, but also faced hindrance from re religious communities. The eradication of slavery was both benefited and hampered by the church. And the women's movement was not strengthened by the role of the church in the U.S., but perhaps it is outside of the U.S. The church has been deeply conflicted on the issues of LGBTQ persons. And the eradication of, pro of poverty is not yet accomplished. <laughs> And young people are making strides for protection and gun violence prevention with a moral and religious voice. And they need us to stand in solidarity with them. So what is the future of religion in the public square? The role of the church in faith communities, church and society, higher education and ministry is notable it is remarkable, and it is unfinished. The peoples of the world in South Carolina and Tennessee and the families on the U.S.-Mexico border and Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire need the church, need the church to address old and new forms of injustice, discrimination, suffering, war, racism, tribalism, abuses of civil and human rights, violence in the home, and violence in the world. But the good news is, the future belongs to us and to our children. Those claiming the name of Jesus Christ, who is the way of justice and peace. So what then shall we do? John Meacham's book, The Soul of America, The Battle for Our Better Angels, is an inspiring and hopeful book, and it challenges us to continue toward a more perfect union of bringing together, in his words, acts of citizenship and of private grace. This is the marriage of the private sphere and the public square, acts of citizenship and of private grace. Thank you.